Okay, uh, I'll be presenting work done by uh, Venkatesh Srinivasan, uh, me, Ara Vartanian, and Thomas Reps uh, on machine code synthesis. Uh, specifically, I'll be presenting our, result, our results on the McSynth ML synthesizer, which uses machine learning techniques to improve the efficiency of synthesis. Uh, our approach to synthesis takes place within a broader framework of binary rewriting. So uh, I'm going to begin by locating it within a binary rewriting architecture. I'll review the previous work uh, that we're building off of and then I'll uh, go ahead and describe our contribution. So the task of machine code synthesis falls in the broader category of binary analysis. Binaries are of course pervasive and of course sometimes we lack source code for them in documentation. Our binaries might be legacy or they might be untrusted motivating the need for automated tools to analyze and potentially rewrite them. Why rewrite binaries? Well, there are a lot of applications for a binary rewriter. We might rewrite binaries to optimize them uh, either by super optimization or partial evaluation. Uh, if we have interest in security for program repair or obfuscation or to extract an executable component like a program slice. So let's talk about the architecture of a semantics based binary rewriter. In one possible design, we convert our binary into some semantic representation, for example, a logical formula. We can then perform, uh, we can perform this conversion at, at a per instruction level or at a level of basic blocks. And now uh, we can use traditional static analysis to transform the logical formula. For example, one can do a value set analysis or a definition use analysis. And from a transformed formula, you can use a synthesizer like MCSYNTHML to generate a new binary. This forms a transform, analyze, synthesize loop that would be called many times to rewrite a complete binary. So the complete idea, so the key idea to take away here is that we can produce different rewriters just by modulating our static analysis. We've used this architecture, for example, and MCSYNTHML to create a machine code partial evaluator and a machine code slicer. However, even with a state-of-the-art machine code synthesizer, this rewriter is just not fast enough. To rewrite a typical binary, uh, which will have you know, hundreds of thousands of basic blocks and instructions, the rewriter would have to invoke MCSYNTH hundreds or thousands of times. And each call to MCSYNTH can take a few minutes or a few hours to obtain an implementation for the input formula, leading to a prohibitive cost of what could be hours or more likely days. So our contribution here is to speed up our search uh, by introducing machine learning methods that pick synthesis candidates that are more likely to be correct. So to make the discussion concrete, I'm just going to talk about a few instructions from IA32. All you need to know about IA32 for the, follow for the sequent is going to be the following. Uh, ESP is uh, the stack pointer register. Push instructions, push an operand on the stack and update the pointer. The stack is depicted growing upward because you put things on top of it, uh, even though addresses are decreasing. For instructions with two operands, the operand on the left is the destination and the operand on the right is the source. The move instruction, for example, will move the contents of the EAX register into EDX. Square brackets indicate memory location operands. The instruction here moves the value 40 into the location pointed to by the stack pointer except in the case of something like load effective address in which the square brackets indicate the effective address of the operand. So this instruction here will increment uh, the stack pointer by four. So with that basic background, I'm going to describe our prior work, which is a system called McSynth++. McSynth++ synthesizes a machine code instructions uh, sequence from a semantic specification of the desired behavior. Uh, think of the instruction sequences themselves as syntax for which we have some, some representation, some semantic representation. One such representation could be a quantifier free bit vector formula, henceforth uh, QFBV. For example, if the instruction push EAX is the syntax, uh, then the formula here is the semantics. These formula are over the registers, flags, and memory locations of the machine with the prime vocabulary representing the post state vocabulary as usual. Now the complete formula is going to be a lot longer. Uh, for example, it will contain all these identity updates. You can think of that as sort of constraints uh, for portions of the state that are not modified by the instructions. Uh, but to keep things uncluttered, I'm only going to show the relevant portions of the QFBV formula. So McSynth++ takes this QFBV as input 
and synthesizes an instruction sequence that's semantically equivalent to the input formula. Now, there are certainly many instruction sequences that can, in principle, satisfy the same formula. Uh, here's another one that, uh, you know, that is equivalent to the input formula. McSynth++ is going to be parameterized by the syntax and semantics of the instruction set, so you can inst instantiate it for different ISAs, even though we're using I32. So, what McSynth++ faces is the challenge of an enormously large synthesis search space. Taken with its operands, you can think of IA32 as containing billions of instructions. Uh, if we abstract away from the immediate operands, uh, we are still left with a huge number of instruction schemas. This, along with the expen exponential cost inherent in enumerative synthesis, gets you to what's just too large a search space for a naive enumeration to perform well. A naive enumeration can take, to give you a sense of what the magnitude I'm talking about here is, can take several hours or even days just to synthesize an instruction sequence of length two. So what do we do to tame this? To sort of to help tame the, the search space, we employ a divide and conquer strategy on the intuition that it's going to be easier to satisfy independent subformula and then concatenate the resulting instruction sequences than it's going to be to synthesize a, a sequence for the entire formula. For larger QFBV, this strategy brings down the synthesis time by several orders of magnitude already. We employ a master-slave architecture which splits formula fee into independent subformulas and then hands over each subformula to a slave synthesizer. The master concatenates the results produced by the slaves and returns a resulting instruction sequence. If any of the slaves time out, an alternative split is tried. If all possible splits time out, the slave is given the unsplit formula as input. So we sort of, you know, progressively back off if, we, if, this, if we're splitting too finely. To illustrate, consider a formula that stipulates that EAX be set to the value in the memory location uh, pointed to by ESP plus 10, and that the stack pointer should be incremented by 18, uh, and that the zero flag should be set if and only if uh, ESP plus 10 is zero. The master splits our formula in such a way that if you concatenated the synthesized instructions for the subformula, you'd satisfy the original. Now, the first slave will take a few seconds to find an implementation, but the second takes around 10 minutes. The slave, enum uh, the slave enumerates candidate sequences using two pruners to eliminate useless candidates. Uh, a footprint, footprint based pruner uses the abstract semantic use and kill footprints to eliminate candidates which user kill locations that are not referenced in the formula on the intuition that they can't be part of any optimal synthesis sequence. A bits loss pruner, pruner eliminates candidates which eliminate bits of information that are required by subsequent subformula in our split on the intuition that no further synthesis can recover them. After pruning, we're going to search for an instantiation of the candidate which satisfies the subformula using a CGIS, a counterexample guided synthesis loop. Effectively, the slave performs a linear search over the space of instruction sequences. It first exhausts length one sequences, then moves to length two sequences, and then three instruction sequences, and so forth. So one can see opportunities for improvement there. The slave is not performing any prioritization in an environment where not all candidates are equally likely to implement P. And that's the setting for the topic of our paper. So imagine you were tasked with learning to pro propose candidate instructions for synthesis. Your first intuition might be that any conditional distribution of code we observe, conditional on being optimal, on being written by humans, on being compiler produced, encodes something our search procedure might take advantage of. In machine translation of natural language, to make an analogy, we call this property fluency. The idea is that if you are translating into English, you might want something that sounds fluently like English, regardless of the language it came from. For this, we're going to use a, a simple n-gram model over sequences. The model tracks the idea that some instructions occur more commonly or co-occur more commonly with each other than with others. But your second intuition might be that, of course, the instructions we want should depend somehow on our formula. 
to draw again an analogy to natural language, we call this property faithfulness. We want our fluent English to actually be a faithful translation from the original. So in this analogy, think of the instruction sequence as being translated from the original QFBV formula. For this, we use a, a regression model that gives us a probability over how likely an instruction is to occur in the synthesized sequence. Our training samples here would constitute basically uh, sets of, of specification implementation pairs. Now, you might ask yourself, if synthesis is difficult, where can we find such a corpus? Well, while synthesis from a formula to an instruction sequence is difficult, it turns out that we can map from an instruction sequence to a QFBV formula straightforwardly and quickly through symbolic execution. For example, creating a corpus of 4.4 million uh, of these specification implementation pairs took only about 12 hours by this method. Our regression model was featureized on the instruction side and on the formula side. On the instruction side, uh, our, our instruction features are opcode variants, equivalence classes of opcode categories like addition, multiplication, logical operations, and operand sizes, you know, 8-bit, 16-bit, 32-bit, and so forth. The presence or absence of QFBV vocabulary items in fee constituted our formula features. Otherwise, the design of MixSynthML is similar to that of MixSynth++. It employs the same master-slave architecture. And assisted by our models, though, uh, our linear search becomes a best-first search. So how do we use these models during synthesis? Suppose the current candidate set of prefixes looks like that. The search uses an interpolation of the two models to choose which prefix to expand. Now, a desideratum of our design is that we don't want to simply learn the suboptimal code we might happen to see in some training corpus. So our design constraint here is that we maintain the same completeness guarantee of MixSynth++. Since our models don't prune away instruction sequences but merely reprioritize them, we, we're going to maintain the same completeness property. There's one further optimization step. At the beginning of synthesis, we use our regression model to truncate the instruction pool. That is, uh, we threshold the instruction pool to contain only opcode variants, which our regression model predicted to be likely contained in the sequence. In our experiments, this step reduced the size of the instruction pool by tenfold on average. If synthesis with the truncated pool fails, we fall back on the untruncated pool. So again, our completeness property is preserved. OK, so how do we test that all this works? We created a corpus of QFBV formula harvested from 10 binaries in the second 2006 benchmark suite, again uh, using symbolic execution. We harvested the most frequently occurring sequences of lengths 6 through 10 in each of the 10 binaries to create a 50 instruction sequence test suite. We did this in a manner to avoid overlaps. For example, uh, if you pick the most commonly occurring six-length sequence, you might otherwise have been found something which is going to be a prefix of the most commonly occurring seven-length sequence. If that occurred, we just threw it out. We used a similar design over the second most commonly occurring sequences to create a validation set to fit the tuning parameters of our model, again enforcing uniqueness. So we have, you know, for example, the cutoff to determine uh, and the interpolation between the two models to use. In principle, so there, though, in principle, there's no restriction on the source of QFBV formula. They don't need to be harvested from any existing binaries or anything like that. To keep the test suite and training corpus independent, we used a tenfold cross-validation scheme. If a test formula came from a binary, the training corpus was harvested from the remaining nine binaries. So even though in the presentation I just gave it, it made it sound like there was one big corpus that we were drawing from. And in fact, in our experiments, there were in effect 10 distinct training corpora. Okay, so how does all this, how well does all this work? Uh, here are what the synthesis times for MixSynth ML look like in comparison to MixSynth++. Uh, the axes are in log scale. It should be noted that MixSynth++ timed out on 60 of the, six, uh, six of the 50 formula. 
And the timeout value was three days. So for those, we have no idea how long it would have taken to finish. McSynthML did not timeout on any of the formula in the test suite. The reason for the timeout is that these test items required subformula which could only be implemented by at least three instructions. For these formula, McSynthML produced an average speed of, of at least 526 volt. For the formula that did not time out, the average speed up produced by McSynthML was four and a half volt. In particular, McSynthML performed better on more difficult formula. Uh, if we consider formula whose baseline synthesis time was 100 seconds or greater, the speed up is more pronounced at 12 volt. Uh, and uh, one thing which is not on the slide I should point out is that uh, for none of, nothing in the test we did, we actually have to fall back to McSynth++ plus's linear search. So we always found something inside the truncated pool. Now let's say we wanted to ask ourselves what the individual contributions of the model assisted best first search and the instruction pool truncation were to the overall speed up. So this uh, table here is, is broken up into quadrants. The top left represents neither, uh, neither of our speed ups. It's just McSynth++ which is our baseline and has six timeouts. Uh, six formulas which time out. Then say we add a model assisted best first search. Uh, you know we get, we, we lose all the timeouts. Um, we get the 38 fold speed up on those. And say we didn't use the model assisted best, model assisted best first search but just the truncation strategy. We again don't incur any of the timeouts uh, and get a 200 fold speed up uh, on those items. So the bottom right here is McSynthML, which uses both of these methods. Uh, so you can see that the regression-based uh, instruction pool truncation seems to have a more pronounced effect on the speed up, which suggests that the discriminative model was doing a little bit better than the generative or the ingrained model. So uh, to wrap up, we've introduced machine learning techniques for our style of machine code synthesis from specification formula. We've used best first search assisted by models learned from readily available sources. Our models prioritize some candidates over others but retain the completeness property. And over a baseline of a previous synthesizer, we have a 526 fold speed up on formula that timed out and a four and a half fold speed up on remaining formula. So, thank you very much for your time and that concludes my talk and I'd be happy to take any questions.